in the current economy, the commercial success of a book, uh, in, and I know I'm in an academic environment, but I do, I write for a living. It's not a hobby. It's my job. And therefore, the commercial success of a book is very, very important to me. Um, um, the commercial success of a book now depends on, on reviews, uh, on free media. That's because publishers no longer have ad budgets. They no longer send authors on book tours unless your name is Sarah Palin or Jerry Seinfeld or somebody like that. Um, so I was really thrilled when the first reviews of The Liberator were, were, were absolute rave reviews. Um, it means a lot because it motivates the publisher, like, oh, we might have something here. Let's do more with it. Then I got a call from my publicist at Random House saying that a major national newspaper was going to review the book in its Sunday edition. That was great news, and I couldn't wait for the review to be posted online. So late on a Thursday night, I found the review, and I learned that I had absolutely wasted the last two years of my life. Those of you who engage in oral history as a profession should pay attention. Those of you who are students and want to do it should also pay attention because you may want to rethink your life's work. Here is what the Princetonian putts at the post said. <laughs> the recollections of elderly men are no match for contemporaneous accounts. He went on to suggest that letters home and official army reports were worth quoting, but he says, quote, the recent interviews with the men often fall into cliches about bodies stacked like cordwood. This afternoon, I'm going to talk a lot about bodies stacked like cordwood and the men who found them. And we'll come back to the guy at the post. <laughs> but first, a bit about process and substance. Um, how did the book come about? I was asked by an editor at New American Library that I had worked with on the book that took me to Afghanistan to write a blurb for a Vietnam book. And I emailed him the blurb, and at the end of it I said, um, I I'm looking for something to write next. And implicit in that question is something that write next that will sell. Because uh, there's a lot of ideas I have that I keep getting told won't sell. Um, and he said, well, World War II stuff is still viable. And it took me three minutes, maybe less, um, and I emailed him back, and I said, I want to track down the guys who liberated the concentration camps, talk about what they experienced, what they did, and how it's affected their lives. And the reason that was in my head was because about three weeks earlier, I had seen a PBS documentary called The Jewish Americans, and in it was maybe a 30, 35 second clip from a New York attorney, retired attorney named Alan Moskin, who had been with the 71st Infantry Division at a camp called Gunskirchen, and it just stuck in my head. And I sent this email to uh, the editor at NAL, and he said, um, that's a great idea. And so I elaborated on it and sent it to my agent, and he said, that's a great idea. When you're batting two for two, um, you, you don't stop. Um, I ended up writing a proposal for the book, uh, a proposal for a nonfiction book, at least the way I do it because the way my agent wants me to do it uh, runs anywhere from 60 to 80 pages. It includes at least one sample chapter. It includes, if possible, a list of the proposed chapters for the book, a reason why this book should be done, what else is out there, um, and uh, how you're going to put it together. Um, what I had to do was point out that there's never been a book like this written before. And that I still find strange. To, to come up in 2008 with what I call a new angle on the Holocaust is absolutely bizarre. Um, there have been a couple of academic books that had some interviews with liberators, but nobody's actually looked at the liberation of the camps as part of military history. If you look at some of the best books about the end of World War II, John Tolan's The Last Hundred Days, several others, if they mention the camps at all, it's half a sentence. And that's primarily because liberating the camps was, was not a, a military objective. Um, if anything, it slowed the army down because suddenly you free 20,000 people and now they're yours. You have to feed them, clothe them, shelter them, and, and medicate them. Um, so, so it was a matter of writing a proposal that pointed this out. Um, I, I went to Mobile, Alabama for the reunion of the 42nd Infantry Division. The reunion 
the soldiers there were maybe 35, 40 of them, plus family, wives, uh, some children, some grandchildren, um, and got some stories. And then I began searching online uh, and tracked down some other people. Um, then it was a question of, okay, how do you put it together? And I discovered that there had been an agreement between the U.S. Army Center of Military History and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Um, they wanted to designate liberating units, which uh, if you read the introduction to the book, you'll see I think was a really terrible idea. But it resulted in the, the Army putting together a list of the divisions in chronological order in terms of what camp they liberated from Ordruf, which was a subcamp of Buchenwald on April 4th, 1945, to the last camps in Austria that were liberated, May 7th and 8th. May 8th was VE Day. Um, I, I wrote the proposal, um, and we had several publishers interested in the book, and the book sold quickly. And now it was a question of tracking down guys. Um, the first way to look for people was through the Army Division Associations. 80th Infantry Division has an association. Uh, not many members left, just like the 42nd Division. Uh, but they were having a reunion in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, and I went to that reunion. I went to the reunion, I believe, the 69th Infantry Division. And then you start looking online and you find that these divisions have websites. Without the web, this book doesn't happen um, it, because it would take forever to find people. I mean, without, you know, little things like Google, Zaba search to try and find, you know, you get, you get a name, you know, James Jones, or whatever the name happened to be, lives somewhere in California, you know, and fortunately you have something like Zaba search and you can put it in and you start calling all the James Jones. Thank God there were no James Jones in the book. Um, and, and you find somebody. And then, then, then you begin to feel, um, dread when you start to dial a phone number because the first time it happens you realize this is going to happen a lot. You dial the number and you get beep 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 this number is no longer in service and you go oh crap too late. Or you get a woman answering the phone and you ask for Mr. So-and-so. Who's calling? Oh my name is Michael Hirsch this is what I'm doing. So well he died three months ago or he died six months ago. Then you try and talk to the widow and say do you know any of his friends who are with him? And occasionally you pick up names that way. Um, so tracking down the people took a long time. I probably spent six months doing nothing but that, uh, using every investigative technique you know, that, I, that I've ever learned. Um, as I was tracking them down, of course, you know, I'd get them on the phone and I'd say, can I record an interview with you? And that's the recorder I used. Um, it's the first book I've done that didn't use actually tape cassettes. This is so much easier. Uh, but it also has a trap. Um, the trap is that there's no limit on the amount of time you have. I don't have to worry about, you know, a 90-minute cassette and turning it over. Um, you can just keep talking. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about talking. Um, I, I've I, I know when I did the first interview in my life. I was in sixth grade. I was at Bateman School in Chicago, Illinois, and, and we started a school newspaper, and there was a magician coming to put on a performance, and I said, I want to go interview him. I don't even know how I knew that word. And the headline in the newspaper was, Mr. Irving Makes Magic. And this was a guy who drove from a small town in Michigan to Chicago and would go from school to school doing magic shows. And that's the first interview I, I've done, I did. And, and I haven't stopped interviewing people since then. Um, I, I've been accused of, of having conversations with people that feel like interviews. Um, it's it, it just, it just the way it is. Um, and for whatever reason, um, people talk to me. People will answer all sorts of questions that they never thought they would ever tell anybody. Um, it's just, I don't know whether it's a skill, I don't know what it is, but I have it. Um, I've done interviews for newspapers, uh, magazines, radio news, both live and recorded, um, television documentaries, which means they're recorded, live television programs. Uh, I hosted a radio talk show in Chicago uh, for 10 years. 
uh, on a station called WLS, which at the time reached most of the country. I mean, 50,000 watts clear channel on a Sunday night. We'd get calls from everywhere but the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I've done interviews for books. Um, they're all different. Um, doing interviews for books is probably the most fun because they're really conversations and you have no constraint except the time of the other person. Um, if they have time, I'll keep talking and I'll keep asking questions. Um, and, and if you keep picking around, you will find that people um, enjoy the opportunity to talk about themselves. Um, especially if you're talking to people who've had this bottled up in them for half a century and they've never been asked about it. Uh, and that's what I ran into here. Um, so I work from the premise that, that my time is unlimited and digital media is cheap and the only price I pay is, is it costs me a whole lot more to have them transcribed um, and it takes a lot of time to go through the transcripts and mark them up the way I do and you know, highlight on the computer. I don't even print them out anymore, thank God. But highlight them in, you know, in bright yellow and bright green, in, in, in purple, and then if it's really something I have to make sure I put in the book in bright red, um, that's what I do. Um, the, I said that these interviews are really conversations. Um, and that means um, you can go off track, but that's okay. You can talk about shared experiences. When, when a man starts telling me about a combat experience and being under artillery fire, or under mortar fire, and, and he stops, I, I can talk to him and say, I understand that experience. On July 26, 1966, at 7.35 p.m., I understood that experience. We got mortared for the first time, and it scared the living crap out of me. And if I'm willing to tell him that I was terror stricken and it scared the living crap out of me. It gives him permission to tell me how he felt in World War II. When you listen to some of the tapes, you will hear it. The downside of that is, is I'm a little bit self-conscious about having some of these conversations available in their entirety because there's a lot of crap about me that you don't really care about. But the point of it was to make the person on the other end of the line or the person I'm sitting across from comfortable and get them talking. So I, I wrote a little introduction for the oral history uh, website that basically says, you know, when you get to the part where I'm talking about myself, just push fast forward. Um, some questions about technique always come up. Um, one of which is, do I prepare a list of questions um, in a very limited way? Um, if, if I'm talking to somebody um, about Buchenwald, and I've already talked to a guy about Buchenwald, and he's told me this, this, and this, I, I'll make a note to say I need to talk, I need to ask another person who's been there the same thing. Um, I find that people who are r relatively new to interviewing, and this goes to, you know, especially to, to people in journalism, um, if you prepare a list of questions, uh, you often stop listening to the answers. And that's not a good thing, because answers can lead you down wonderful, mysterious paths, and you can learn all sorts of things. Um, so you stop listening, it's like, why should you listen? You already know what your next question is going to be. Uh, you can't do that. And maybe it's my radio talk show experience, but I listen to answers with two mindsets. Um, I, I pay careful attention to what the person's saying because it might lead me to something else um, that I really hadn't considered. But at the same time, I do try to have that next question in mind so there's no dead air. It sounds contradictory to have both those things going on at the same time, but it, but it is doable. In the beginning of a project, I absolutely have no hesitation to plead I ignorance in talking with some of the people. I if you listen to the interviews as they're posted, if you listen to the early ones, you'll hear me uh, unapologetically or apologetically asking what I'll call dumb questions. There really are no dumb questions, but 
um, guys would talk about, you know, Nebelwerfers, a certain kind of multiple rocket thing that the Germans would use. I'd never heard of it. And when the guy starts talking about it, I stop him and say, w what are you talking about? Uh, I, 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 I don't mind appearing ignorant, you know. Um, it, it, it doesn't hurt me. And I'm being honest with the guy at the other end, and I also don't want to miss anything. Um, what that means, however, is that maybe the early interviews on a project where I know less aren't as good as the interviews that come a little bit later uh, because I know a lot more and I can lead people into other areas. Um, and to be honest, maybe the last interviews aren't as good as the ones in the middle and that's because I've heard a lot of it before and I may try and hurry somebody on a little bit. Um, another problem that I have with this book in particular and those of you involved in oral history should, should be aware of, um, and, and if I'm telling you things you know, I'm sorry. Um, you need to get interviewees to answer questions based on what their own personal experience was, not on what they've read or learned over the years or picked up from their buddies at reunions. Um, many times I'll say, is that something that happened to you or something you heard? And sometimes you gotta keep poking that to make sure. Um, because, 65 years later, some of them believe it happened to them. They're not lying, they believe it. And you need to be able to figure out how to sort that out. Um, now, what happens when a lot of guys, you're writing a book, and a lot of the people say the same thing? Is that a plus or a minus? So let's go back to the review by the Princetonian Putts at the Post. He wrote, each time the author quotes a letter home or even an army report, it bristles with pain and disgust. On the other hand, the recent interviews with the men often fall into cliches about bodies stacked like cordwood. I would guess that a third of the men and some of the women I interviewed used that phrase. When I first heard it, it was chilling. What's it mean, bodies stacked like cordwood? That's a man from Cambridge, Minnesota named Jim uh, Duos. He had just come around the back of the crematorium at Buchenwald, and that's what he was confronted with. 65 years later, somebody who calls that a cliche near, probably deserves to get hit by a car. Okay? That, that's, what, that's what our guys saw. But the phrase itself presented a writing problem. Um, how do I preserve its impact on the reader if I have to use it 50 times? Um, it's not the best thing to do, to repeat a phrase like that. Um, so in the first draft of the introduction uh, that I sent to my editor, I, I specifically, I, I quoted Hannah Arendt who covered the Eichmann trial and wrote a book called The Banality of Evil. And in that book, uh, in the title of the book, um, she was talking about how something so horrible just became commonplace. What I had here with the phrase, body stacked like cordwood, was a banality of language. You hear it 25 times and it just doesn't mean that anymore. You know? And, and it needed to mean that's a 19-year-old kid who is being confronted with mass murder and attempted murder on a scale heretofore unknown. And so when I wrote the introduction, I, I, I addressed the reader directly and I said, um, I might have used the word beseech, but then somebody pulled that out. And I said, you know, I, you need to be aware of this, that this phrase will come up again and again and you have to see it through 19, 18, 19, 20 year old eyes and realize each one is a discrete individual case and you have to remember it that way. And my editor called me and he said, you gotta take that out and I said, why? He said, don't tell your reader how to read the book. Write it as best you can and trust your readers. And so that's what I did. When I read the introduction, there's still a bump in the middle where I know two paragraphs have come out. And you may think it flows, and I'm looking at it, and it's like, 
it, it just smacks me every time. Um, as for as for that being a cliche, you have to ask why 65 years later so many of the guys use that phrase. And in order to do that, you just have to know how do they heat their homes in the 30s and in the 20s with wood, cords of wood. That's that's what they were seeing. It's their point of reference. It's not a cliche. So I have some suggestions what the guy at the post can do with a cord of wood. I always get asked how I felt while writing the book. Um, I cried during a number of the interviews. When you're talking to a 90-year-old man on the phone, and he's relating to you an experience that happened 65 years ago, and he breaks down crying at the memory of what he saw. I, I cried too, and it shocked me, because um, in the time I've been a journalist, I, I've spent a lot of time immersed in a lot of ugliness. I did a five program series for PBS on the prevention of child sexual abuse, I, I did a program called College Can Be Killing that dealt with college suicide uh, and the lack of responsibility that universities take for the emotional well-being of their kids. Uh, I've done programs about rape, and I never cried. I first realized that that was going on in Vietnam. I did the first story in Vietnam about a conscientious objector medic, a young kid, 19-year-old kid named Paul Whitfield from Council Bluffs, Iowa. And I had done the story. And the story got printed, and I went back down to the battalion to find him and show him the story. And I was told that he, along with nine or ten other guys, had been executed while out on an ambush. Bullet in the head. Gone. And I went into what I later began describing as reporter mode, where you just don't feel anything. Your job is to be, does the name Joe Friday mean anything to anybody in the room? Just the facts. You get the facts, and you don't feel. So now I'm 66 years old, or 65, when I'm working on this, and I'm talking to a 90-year-old guy, and I'm just crying on the phone with him. It really surprised me, but it was appropriate. What else can you do? Um, I, I couldn't go into reporter mode for this book. Um, how else did I feel? I, I, I came out of a couple of, uh, of the chapters with a burning anger at the German civilian population. And to be absolutely honest with you, it hasn't gone away. Um, these were civilians who engaged in, in mass murder at the last minute. They knew they'd lost the war. The American army was, you know, hours or days away, and they're engaged in, in, in just indiscriminate killing. Um, I, I, guess, I guess they felt they couldn't help themselves. This is what they had to do. Uh, there were lots of calls to Jay Wolfson when I was writing about that because I really kept saying, am I wrong to feel this way? You know, is, is it wrong to do that? And, and I won't go into a lot of elaboration here, but then I talked to a woman who lives not far from us who talked to me and mentioned that her father was in the Hitler Youth. Well, the Hitler Youth was involved in the massacre at Gardelegen. Uh, where they heard they, they had they had evacuated pr their prisoners from the Dora Middelbach camp on two trains. The trains could only go so far. They have a death march from then. They shoot 900 of them. They end up with just a little over a thousand prisoners in this village of Gardelegen, and the local uh, Gauleiter. And there's only 30 SS guards for these thousand prisoners, and the local Gauleiter says, "Well, we're going to herd them into this big stucco grain storage barn." But before they do that, they cover the floor with a foot or two of straw, and then the good civilians carry cans of petrol in and soak the straw, and then they lock them in there. And the reason they're doing that is because the Gauleiter says, you know, well, there's another village, you know, 20 miles away, and when the prisoners walk through there, they began to rape and pillage, and we don't want that happening here. So he gets help from the local civilians and the Hitler Youth. And they herd them all in there, and they s set up machine guns outside, and they set the place on fire. And, and then I'm dealing with somebody who says, my father was in the Hitler Youth, but he had to be. I, I still got a problem with that. Um, 
even though there were there were many many moments of pain writing the liberators there were many wonderful moments um, one of them was in a conversation with a man who is no longer with us but who lives in St. Petersburg um, and this is Leonard Mubin um, I spoke with him on the phone and uh, did a long interview with him and then I had to come up to St. Pete and I called and said would you like to have lunch and we met for lunch and talked for probably two more hours um, and uh, he told me the story uh, of his experience at a camp called Wells um, which was a sub camp of Mauthausen which is near the Austrian German border um, I I'd like to read part of it it's in the book but I'm gonna you know, ask that you indulge me uh, because uh, Leonard Lubin's interview was one of the first things that I thought about when I read that review in the Washington Post. The reviewer wrote, while well-meaning, Hirsch's book can't overcome its flaws. You don't think this really bothers me, do you? <laughs> it's, it's sort of an interesting experience, turning a bad review into useful material. Um, the most basic is that the recollections of elderly men are no match for contemporaneous accounts. Each time the author quotes a letter home or even an army report, it bristles with pain and disgust. On the other hand, the recent interviews with the men often fall into cliches about bodies stacked like cordwood. So let me read you what Leonard Lubin had to say, and you can judge for yourself whether the recollections of elderly men are meaningless. It picks up as he's walking into the center of an Austrian town called Wells, where they've discovered a walled camp, which I, the best we can figure out, it's a place called Wells too. It was a subcamp of Gunskirchen, which was a subcamp of the infamous Mauthausen. The gate was open and the inmates were running out. The sights and sound rendered his mind blank. He says, I'm embarrassed to say it, I was stunned and I can't tell you I was thinking of anything it's like when you come upon an automobile accident, if you've been. I was stunned. I couldn't formulate much in the way of thought. I wasn't thinking as much as I was reacting. We soldiers shouted at each other, what to do? Grab them, somebody shouted. Stop them, grab them. While all of this was happening, more American soldiers were pouring in, and they started chasing down the people. The people who were escaping, we concluded later, were running from us like crazy in a panic. They saw our uniforms and may not have been able to distinguish us from Germans. That or freedom, I couldn't tell you, but they ran like hell. Lubin stops talking for a moment and audibly takes a breath before continuing. Here comes the big moment for me, which to me sums up the whole, the whole war, the whole Holocaust, which is the content of my nightmares. Not dead bodies, I've seen a lot of dead bodies. I wasn't in combat all that long, a few months, mostly chasing like crazy up the highway, but I'd seen plenty of dead bodies, theirs and ours. So it wasn't that. This was something different. Here was this guy, and he had found a food can, a tin can, the larger kind that tomatoes come in. It had been opened with one of those old-fashioned push and lift can openers. You punch a hole in it, and then you lift it all the way around, and it creates a horribly jagged edge you didn't want to handle. You didn't take it all the way to the end. You'd get it close to the end of the circle and then pull the lid up so it stands up and you'd empty the contents and then push the lid back down and throw the can away so you didn't cut yourself because it could make brutal cuts very easily. This man had found one of these cans and was trying to get the contents out of it. He had it with both of his hands jammed up against his face trying to get his tongue into it to lick the contents and lick the top lid and the sides of the can and the blood was pouring down his face, and he was acting totally insane, and that vision is what's in my mind. If I were an artist and could paint a picture, I would, but I can't. Didn't have a camera. So in my nightmares, that's what I see. And to me, that's what the Holocaust was. It wasn't the death. It wasn't a torment of the kind that can reduce a human being to sub-animal status, to be willing to lacerate himself to get a slight bit of nourishment. You might wonder how someone can be so desperate, so hungry, that he can mutilate himself to get food. This was taken at Buchenwald by a US Army soldier. These are the survivors. 
These are the people who managed to make it. There's nothing but skin and bone there. So just to make the point, the image that our soldiers had of what they found were two. Body stacked like cordwood and the walking dead. That's what's in their mind. Um, let me go back to Leonard Lubin. This is from the final chapter in The Liberators, a chapter titled After the War and Long After the War. Leonard Lubin is able to describe his witnessing of the opening of the Wells II camp in precise detail, yet he's openly hostile to being called a liberator in its most common context. It all sounds so exalted, so glamorous, but we didn't do anything to liberate anybody. It's just a bunch of bull. Just a soldier putting one foot in front of another like I was told to do. Happened to be walking down that road like I was told to do and walked into this thing. No Germans there to fight, so I didn't do anything heroic. I hate the term liberator. It's a false thing. Most of us were draftees, and even if we weren't, we were just ordinary people like lots of people today, nothing special. People hear you are a liberator, their eyes glass over and they speak in hushed terms. But he'll accept eyewitness even as he acknowledges that from 1945 to 2006, he never discussed his personal contact with the Holocaust with anyone, 1945 to 2006. But unlike many of the other veterans, he can explain why in emotional detail. I'll answer you about that, what it's all about. You come back here, oh great, happy to have you home. Tell us, what was it like? So you tell him. Concentration camp? Yeah, well, what was it like? Well, all these dead people. Well, tell me about it. What do you mean, what do you want me to tell you? There were dead people, stacked up dead. And then if you look like you're getting emotional or anything, they say, hey, forget it. It's over now, you're back home, whoopee, let's have a picnic, let's have a party, let's buy a car, get some clothes, have a beer. So here you are and you've got this dichotomy. Here are great society, cars, happy people, well-fed happy people. Over there, destroyed society, gone to rubble, the men gone, the women, you could have all you wanted for a pack of cigarettes, and cigarettes were free to us, so the women were free, and a destroyed society. One of the most advanced cultures in the world. You look through who's who of the 1800s, on through until the advent of Hitler. Every other name of achievement, the Germans. They had social security long before we did. It was gone, people's savings were gone. The currency was worthless, a totally destroyed society, spiritually gone and confused. Over here, the other end of the dichotomy, everything was fantastic, terrific. Get on with it, good, forget it. Like you could turn the spigot off and forget it. So you didn't talk about it. And Leonard Lubin comes back to the original question, why didn't he talk? And he acknowledges finally figuring it out after participating in a program at the Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg that it wasn't just a Jewish thing. A non-Jew said he'd never talked. People didn't talk. Part of it was really nobody wanted to hear it. They'd say, do you tell me about it? But then it was, let's get on with it, have a good time, forget it, it's over, forget it, we won, hooray. And something about that tells you people don't want to hear about it. I've talked to survivors, not liberators, survivors of concentration camps with numbers on their arms, and they'll tell you the same thing. People didn't want to hear about it. Leonard Lubin died just about a year ago, a year before the book came out. I'd actually like you to meet his son, Lance, his daughter-in-law, Mary Beth, and his granddaughter, Rachel. Could you guys stand up? Um, let's talk a little bit about oral history. When someone tells you an incredible story, you make, need to make sure that it's not an incredible story. Uh, and the more incredible it is, the more you want to use it, the more you'd better check it out. Um, I, I've talked to uh, people at universities who rely on oral history a lot and they told me long ago that oral history is often not worth the paper it's printed on. Um, the problem is this violates a rule that I was taught by a mentor back when I was 19 years old at the CBS radio station in Los Angeles. Um, he said, don't kill your own story. An elaboration on that is if you believe you have good instincts, don't be so quick to kill your own story. 
In the case of the liberators, I wasn't quick to kill my own story, but I had to be willing to kill some great stories just to be on the safe side. The proposal for the book, the sample chapter, was all about one man uh, who told some great stories. He had been to, uh, with his squad to one of the euthanasia hospitals called Hadamar, and he described everything that was inside and what it was like, and it was a great story. And then he got to a camp called Muldorf, Dachau 3B. And he described going in with his squad and finding the female SS soldier's day room. And he said there were shelves around the day room that had human heads on them. And there were other shelves that had male and female sexual organs arranged in order of size. And it was a great story. And he said, I walked into another room and couldn't believe my eyes because there was a man tacked to a board, nailed to a board, and there was a circular saw, a power saw, and they had removed his rib cage, and they had slashed his vocal cords so you couldn't hear him screaming, but he was still alive with his entrails coming out. And it was a great story. Um, and I used it in the proposal. Um, but when we were about halfway through the editing process, my editor said to me, whatever happened to those great stories? And I said, well, I don't think we want to print them. I, I challenged this man. I said, I need, I need documentation. And he sent me pounds of documents. But none of them put him at Hadamar. None of them really backed up what he told me about Muldorf. Every expert I talked to, every place I looked, if you have something as horrible as that, there are going to be photos. There's going to be another description. Couldn't find any. Yet the stories he told me have been printed in newspapers all over the country. Uh, this is a man who was on first name terms with the founding chair of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And he said the government of Israel had flown him to Israel to honor him. And he said he had been named as one of the righteous Gentiles what they now call the righteous of the nations. But I had the internet, and so I could email the person at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem that maintains the role of the righteous Gentiles and say, is this man's name there? Have you ever named a US soldier to that list? And the answer was no. But he sent me pounds of clippings that said this was so. So nobody checked it out. So he, he's not in the book. Um, but he wasn't a sample chapter. So if those of you are ever planning going into writing, I'll give you a secret of writing book proposals told to me by an editor once. She said, if you can deliver on 75% of what you put in the proposal, no editor will be unhappy. So it's not a fatal flaw. Um, a couple more stories, and then I'll take some questions. There's another story that's not in the book. I, I was up in Chicago, and I talked to the Holocaust Museum that's now in Skokie, Illinois, um, and asked if they knew the name of some, some of these guys. And they, she gave me five of them. And I interviewed several. And then I had this long drive out to the suburbs um, to meet this man. And he starts telling me the story of his liberation of Buchenwald. And you can tell this is a rehearsed speech that he's given many, many times. He talked about speaking to schools. He says his squad goes through Buchenwald, and, th and they open up this door. And I don't know, this must be a pattern, but it's the day room for the female SS. <laughs> and he said, we opened the door, and we stood there, and we vomited. I said, what happened? He said, well, we saw paintings, beautiful paintings on human skin. OK, you've been through a camp and seen bodies like that, and you haven't thrown up. And now you've opened the door, and you're looking across the room, and you're seeing paintings on human skin. I'm sorry, I'm a journalist first. How'd you know it was human skin? Nobody ever asked him that question. Um, we could see the pores. OK. Um, I, 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 
a brief digression. Uh, I, I've written a novel, my post-Hurricane Charlie novel of, of, uh, of murder and insurance fraud in, in Punta Gorda after Hurricane Charlie. And to do some research, I spent a lot of time with an insurance fraud investigator. And he said, you know, a really great technique when you think somebody is telling you a cock and bull story is to keep saying, and what did you do next? And what did you do next? Either they're going to have real good answers and you're going to discover that it's the truth, or they're going to end up in a blind alley, you know. So I asked this guy, well, what did you do next? Well, we went out looking for whoever had done that, and we came to these five SS women in uniform. There were SS women in uniform in, in Buchenwald when the Americans got there. Um, and I said, well, what'd you do? He said, I asked, which one of you painted those beautiful pictures? And he says, this woman tentatively raises her hand. And he says, what's your name? And she says, her name is Ilse Koch. Ilse Koch was the wife of the former commander of Buchenwald. She was known as the bitch of Buchenwald. She did collect tattoos, human skin tattoos, OK? And I said, what'd you do next? He said, I pulled out my 45 and I was going to shoot her right there. But the captain came along and said, don't do that. You know, you'll be arrested, this, that. He said, all my life I regret that I didn't shoot her. But three weeks later, she was tried for war crimes and hanged. OK, thank you very much. Goodbye. Drive back into the city through three hours of traffic. Finally get home to Florida. Go online just to check one fact to make sure I know it and send him an email that said, Ilsa Koch committed suicide in prison in 1967. Um, an observ observation that's strictly anecdotal. Those people whose story uh, turned out to be less than honest were often among those who devoted the most time to public speaking about their experiences, most often to school kids. Um, I, you have to understand, I'm interviewing people who are deemed to be heroes by many. They're not accustomed to having their stories questioned. This is a problem I'm told by people at the Holocaust Museum who interview survivors. It may be a problem you'll run into here if, if, when you're doing these interviews. And you need to be willing to challenge them and not just accept what they say on face value. Um, it, it means you, frankly, need to have the balls to call someone who says they're a Holocaust survivor a liar. But as your lawyers will tell you, don't wor use the word liar. I learned that on the Shivo book. <laughs> Two days on the phone with a libel lawyer saying, you can say they misrepresented the facts. They misstated the facts. The facts, don't, as stated by them, don't comport with reality or the truth. But don't call them a liar. OK? Last story. Um, happened just about a week and a half ago. Phone rings. Hi, this is so-and-so. You remember you interviewed me for your book? Yes, I did. He said, I just got a copy of your book. My story's not in it. Why isn't it in it? And I said, well, I, I remember your story. You were with a squad. He said, that's right. I was with two other guys in a Jeep. And we were, we were intelligence and recon. So we were away from the main unit. The people with the stories are always away from the main unit. It's not a liar. He said, we were on the other side of the river. And they, they came to the Kaufring camps near Landsberg. Yeah, I'm aware that you came to the Kaufring camps near Landsberg. And he said, and, and you found this camp that had a moat around it and a bridge over the moat. And you got out of the Jeep and you went over the bridge. And there were 8,000 people, either Jewish or Hungarian, in there. He said, that's right. That's what I told you. I said, I know that's what you told me. The problem is you were very specific as to where this camp was, what day had happened, and where it was going on. And I checked with every expert I know. And we can't identify the camp. You're calling me a liar. No, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just saying I can't substantiate your story. Why do you have to substantiate my story? Because that's what I do. I, he says, who's your expert? I said, well, there's a, a man who's a PhD um, in Holocaust studies at the Holocaust Museum in Washington who's written their, you know, like 70-pound encyclopedia of the Nazi camps. And I described the location. And the, the, the way you described the camp, and I sent him a transcript of what you said, and he said he doesn't know of any camp like that. There are no photos of it. There's no aerial photos. There's nothing about it. 
He says, so you're calling me a liar. And then his wife starts screaming in the background, he's calling you a liar. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not calling him a liar. And he hung up mad. Um, I have a friend named Peter Herford. I met him when he was the bureau chief for CBS News in Saigon in 1966. We've been friends ever since. He's currently a journalism professor at Shantou University in China. Um, and he's really been my mentor since 1966 and my toughest critic. Um, and uh, I told him the story I just told you. And this is what I got back by email. He said, for the next interview book, you might preprint two letters. The first one goes like this, dear so-and-so, thank you for the time and effort you gave me in our interviews. There were a number of facts that I could not verify after extensive research. I respect your memory and recollections, but my editor and publisher have stringent standards of multiple source research, which barring further verification, prevent me from including your interviews in the book. Again, my thanks. The alternative he suggested goes like this, dear so-and-so, I was not able to include your interviews in my book. Turns out you're a fucking liar. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>